FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm. Thank you for joining Agile FM um, again. Today I have a guest with me. Uh, he is the CEO of Wiki Speed. Uh, he is influential in Scrum in Hardware. He actually wrote the Scrum in Hardware guide. He's also um, a chair, president of the Agile Business Institute, uh, whom I'm talking to is a TEDx talker, Joe Justice. Welcome to the podcast, Joe. It is fantastic to be here. Thank you very much for putting together Agile FM. You have wonderful speakers. I, I love it. And I'm privileged to be a part of it. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, spending time here with me and uh, most importantly with all the listeners out there uh, that would like to hear a little bit more um, about uh, Scrum in hardware. We want to talk a little bit about Wikispeed, but you're such a visionary person. I want to talk also about some other things um, as well. Uh, visionary uh, in the context that um, uh, Scrum, hardware, software, right? So there's a lot of these conversations are going on. There's a reason why you wrote the Scrum and Hardware Guide because there are some things different. Um, but um, there's also possibly a conversation, should we isolate IT as something very, very special or so maybe Agile as a, as a whole. So if you, um, if based on your experience and what you do uh, in the hardware space in particular with Wikispeed, and we have all these links up on the show page, what are the differences between hardware, software related projects? What are like the main things that drive hardware projects from an agile perspective, or maybe even Scrum and more in particular, very different than IT? What I'm learning is agile works really well when we have a short feedback loop, when people can do something and see if it passes the test quickly, it keeps the motivation high, the morale high. It allows for a different type of exploratory engineering, emergent architecture, all activities that are hallmarks of Agile, but are difficult to do with long running processes. What that tells us for hardware is hardware is very often built in really long cycles. Sometimes even the required tests are really long, like weatherization testing and durability testing. Sometimes they take months. That lets a lot of hardware leadership have a mindset of, well, let's just drive the cost down because we know it's going to take a long time anyway. So if they have a choice between working with a supplier that's across the street or a supplier that's half the price but has a six month lead time with shipping, times with goods on ships, like legitimately on boats, mm -hmm. a lot of the time that mindset will say, we'll use the supplier that's half the price even though there's a six month lead time and not the one that can walk across the street with a part because our engineers are taking months anyway in design and then months anyway in test. Well, agility doesn't work in that environment mm -hmm. where it, it, the feedback loop is too long for people to be excited for evolutionary design uh, to have a reasonable cadence for any type of rhythm. Well, where this works, where it looks like this agility stuff works <clears throat> is some hardware can be done in a week or less. Some testing can be done in a week or less. Some suppliers will engage in a week or less. That's where agility lives. And that's mm. true in construction, in circuit boards, in pharmaceuticals. Some of it can be done on short cycles. And as innovation grows globally, mm -hmm. what can be done on a short cycle increases every single week. And that's part of what thrills me as someone in this space is keeping tabs on the machines, the materials, the methods that allow something new to be accomplished in less than a week. So that scope grows all the time. What's happened is that scope has grown so rapidly, so quickly that you can build entire cars, including their design in less than a week. When I realized that I got so excited, I couldn't sleep at night. And I, I was shocked no one was doing it. So shocked and so excited that I started doing it. And I, I proved it could be done. Uh, the team that I was a part of, Wikispeed and still am, set mm -hmm. four world records doing it. And we built cars in one week or less. The fastest was a car that had new design built uh, in 27 minutes, uh, wow. which is one of the world records. Mm -hmm. So it, there's some types of materials and tests that can't be run in less than a week. And Agile doesn't fit very well there. It's hard to stay motivated. It's hard to have the fast feedback loop. It's hard to test and learn. It's hard to inspect and adapt or it's harder, right? Yeah. 
it's hard to do it with the high motivation, the thrill that is a hallmark of a living agile organization. But you can do stuff like build a whole house now. You can, including the design and the architecture and the engineering reviews. It's just up to your municipality. Will their permitting uh, team keep pace with you? And sometimes they will. Yeah. Uh, you can build an entire car. I've been working with clients building entire airplanes approved for flight in less than a week, including design versions of their air aircraft. It, that's what seems to shock people is a lot of folks didn't realize the machinery, the processes, the materials have evolved to the point that they could build some mm -hmm. very interesting things in less than a week. And it's turning the point that entire hospitals are being built in less than a week now. Right. Uh, train stations are being built in less than a week now. Um, and the interesting pressure that that seems to be creating is on any company that's not making their product in less than a week because somewhere, someone in the world, someone is trying and they're mm -hmm. often succeeding and it makes long lead cycles completely irrelevant. Their, their customer base disappears in less than a quarter. Now that creates a lot of business opportunity. People want to figure out how to do Scrum hardware. They want to figure out how to do Agile hardware. Uh, and that's why all the best selling books on Agile and Scrum have sections on Scrum hardware. They're all interviews of Team Wikispeed members. Yeah. Myself included. I mean, this is, this is awesome, right? And you're absolutely right. There is a lot of interest. You are providing workshops out of your garage and, uh, and uh, you're actually, there's teams and there is a, I would say like a, a random group of people are showing up small growing, you know, and they all want to work on these uh, cars in, in this particular case. So you are, a, um, you're obsessed with cars, right? We're actually doing this recording, you being in a car, right? So um, I love that passion, right? So I, I think that is, that is awesome. I currently uh, work with a, uh, more and more clients that are interested in expanding to the hardware side and whatever, kind of hardware things they're building, it doesn't matter if it's a car or not. One thing that is, um, seems to be a common trend is that, and I had that recently on a podcast here with Rick Dove, uh, who actually said there is a separation between, uh, in, in hardware, between somebody who designs the work and somebody who actually does the, the work on the, on the hardware, right? So there is, well, as a software programmer, he thinks about the design, it's in our brains, and then I'm articulating it in form of code. So it's the same person. That is not something we would see or what I have seen in the hardware space is something that is very typical. Is that something you would share? Is it something that model needs to be broken? Or is that something that has to be accommodated? I completely agree with you with what you were just saying. Is that a, a shift that needs to happen? If we think about software in the 1980s or even in the late 70s, Mm -hmm. It was exactly as hardware is now. You had separate teams creating the designs, you had separate teams implementing, and you had separate teams compiling. In mm -hmm. hardware, the compiler is the factory. And we have really slow compilers that aren't being run by the same people writing the code, which are the designers. Mm -hmm. And that's how software was. And in the 80s and late 70s, software projects were multi-year events, large ones. Sometimes they were up, up to a decade for very yeah. large ones. It's exactly the same cadence as hardware now. So what made software faster? It's exactly what you just told us and our listeners. We started having the people who are doing the design be the same people who are doing the compiling. Mm -hmm. And then we found it was even faster for that feedback loop to create good engineering and to keep excitement up is to have the designers be the compilers and the testers. And we started to evolve the concept of full stack. Well, in hardware, we get a huge amount of resistance still, like we did in software. If we all remember, the same thing happened in software in the, in the 80s, and then more in the 90s, and then it got blown up in the 2000s when you couldn't compete if you didn't do it. But we still get pushback from people who say, no, I'm only a requirements engineer. And people saying, no, I'm only a design manager. And mm -hmm. folks saying, well, I'm only a frequency shielding engineer. It's only a subset of a sub practice. Yeah. If you go into Facebook today and someone says, no, I only draw icons, they'll be fired on the spot. Right. Facebook won't hire anyone that's not full stack. 
what we're seeing now is it, it's just like the first year of agility in software for hardware companies. We're wow. just now seeing full stack hardware engineers mm -hmm. where these folks can machine parts, they can do structural 3D printing, they can conduct tests on the finished goods, and they can draw in CAD and CAM mm -hmm. and do simulated testing. That's, that's a very new discipline. Yeah. Um, I, I call those full stack hardware engineers exactly yeah. as we've seen full stack software engineers. Brilliant. So there's really no, no difference uh, on this. How would you um, respond to uh, the, the need or the desire that is something I have heard as well as that these, the length of a sprint in hardware is actually much, much longer than in, um, in, in IT cycles, right? Whereas what you just said was really, really short. We were just, you were just saying like one week, two week kind of things. That is not necessarily what hardware teams out there that are trying to do agile are actually echoing. They're, they would be saying something like it's four, it's possibly six weeks because of certain aspects of uh, logistical things, right? How would you respond to that? Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I love this question because it probes the willingness of that company. And usually there's some people in the company that are very willing and some people who aren't. That's true in software, or finance or hardware or anything else. Um, probing the willingness lets all of us know who's, who's ready to actually make it happen and, and prove yeah. it can be done. The current state of most of these companies is a two year sprint is really fast. And, and by sprint, I mean from design until product on the shelves or service available. So mm -hmm. making income. Yeah. Two and a half years is much more reasonable. Three years is, is fairly average. Seven to 14 years is not unheard of depending on the product. Wow. So of course these people look uh, quite surprised when we talk about significantly shorter sprints than that. <clears throat> and what seems to wake people up is when they see a similar product to theirs being made, designed and made and tested and sold on a shorter sprint. That, that creates the wake up call. And that's yeah. happening so often all around the world right now, like this week, mm -hmm. that um, that's creating the buy-in. Mm -hmm. But without that, it takes real visionaries and not everyone has the energy to be a real visionary every day. I mean, yeah. they, they might be ill at home or be having fights with their kids or spouse or yeah. have whatever it is. They don't have 100% of their energy at work to be a, be a visionary all the time. So that's rare. It happens, but it's rare. But when confronted with the reality that their good is being designed and produced on a far faster cadence, they get so excited. Mm -hmm. I, we've all been there. We, we've either been in companies where that was happening or it happened in our own company. We get so excited that we're ready to knock down the artificial barriers we've built around phases and specific skill sets. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's very interesting how to break the patterns, right? And, and see things actually shift. And those cycles you just mentioned, I mean, they're just, I mean, there's little motivation to reinvest into something right after I went through a 14 year, what, what was it like seven, 14 year like uh, cycle. There's probably a little desire to change things up right after that cycle. It's like, we just got a product on the shelf. Um, so, you know, why rock the boat and reinvent that product we just put on the shelf? So what is the incentive, right? So uh, we have to be true to, our, uh, to ourselves. Now we do talk a little bit about cars here. Obviously that's our focus, right? And you do know a lot about cars. Um, you do know a lot about Agile. Uh, what do you know about the car companies, uh, actually, what, what, uh, what they do? Like, because Toyota was huge and lean um, and, you know, like popularized things that are now actually influenced the software world, right? Um, so many, many uh, decades ago. Um, how, how do they um, incorporate now on the manufacturing side some of the actual thinking? Do you have any insights on any, any specific company? It doesn't have to be Toyota, but it's like any companies uh, you, you have interacted, you probably have seen a ton. Oh, wow. Well, I was lucky enough to spend the last year working in Japan, uh, living in Tokyo with almost all of the largest Japanese companies on their agile transformations. And I learned a lot. Yeah. I learned a whole lot. And that included Toyota and Toyota Autonomous Driving, 
and other divisions of Toyota and Toyota suppliers. Mm -hmm. I'd previously worked with Toyota USA. And so now I, I've gotten to do both and, and work in Toyota City near Nagoya and, and all of that. And I worked with um, the next CEO of Toyota, Daisuke Toyota, uh, d directly to, um, to teach Scrum and, 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 and learn a tremendous amount. I mean, let me try to be very clear. In these companies, I, I am the expert in the room and in, in the world in agile hardware. Yeah. That said, these companies know so much more, obviously, about almost every other discipline. The learning opportunity is massive, and I'm very privileged to yes. have gotten to learn in these companies. To your question then, what about the agility inside these companies? I'll, I'll say it's a, it's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. When you're a big successful company, you have less passion for change often for, for two reasons. One, you want to protect what's working. And a lot of things are working nearly perfectly. That's how these companies have been able to employ so many people so well, so effectively and take care of them. And they're really effective companies. Mm -hmm. So there's not as much appetite to change because there are a few big problems and there's always mm -hmm. opportunity. Toyota is the first one to teach all of us that. We can always Kaizen. We can always continuously improve. But many things are working really well. Then the second challenge is these companies are currently so big that even when there's an example of someone else in their domain that's mm -hmm. much, much faster than them, the pressure isn't immediate. So uh, Tesla was a very small company a few years ago. And when they started creating multiple updates to the Model S in a week, and Toyota would make small updates to a core product every two and a half years, the pace was radically different. And the CEO of Toyota commented on it and had a partnership with Tesla for a while and mm -hmm. saying, Elon Musk, I love him, is a quote from the CEO of Toyota. But it wasn't enough to insert agility, this want for short cycles into Toyota. Toyota was fantastic at knocking waste out of the process. And most of the world is still trying to learn even better from mm -hmm. Toyota about how to knock waste out of the process. But Toyota's development cycles are long. And Toyota says that publicly. The, the, mm -hmm. They announced that if you listen to their public statements, they, they admit their cycles are not industry leading. In fact, they're a little bit slow. Right. But they're incredibly lean. They, they don't have much waste. They're, they're masters of yes. that craft and in design too. Um, so let me pump up Toyota and companies like Toyota a little bit more. One of the aspects I'm shocked by how well it works is knocking waste out of even design. And this isn't talked about as much. The Toyota production system is a little better understood. But publicly what I can say in design, Toyota works back from customer requirements, which is very agile. Agilists love that idea. Yeah. Now, what they don't do is iterate regularly on requirements like Agilists have learned to do. So this is an opportunity for most large companies. But Toyota will work backwards from customer requirements in design. And this creates lean design. Agilists are familiar with this concept. This is independently developed in Toyota, where there aren't design branches that are led, in, uh, led by people of mass charisma. N not so much. Yeah. which is very normal in most other big companies. Mm -hmm. It's customer driven back. That means many design branches are not junk. If you look at concept cars for most companies at car shows, which I do constantly, and now most car shows are virtual. Most of those never have any of the aspects shown to production. And yet they're multi-million dollar, in some case, hundreds of million dollar experiments, all people included. Toyota doesn't do that. Their concepts, are versions of production intense stuff, almost 100% of which goes to production because there's very little waste in design. Now, what doesn't happen is short design cycles. Toyota does now want to learn about that. One of the reasons why is Tesla is now so big, and, and this is a public reason why. Toyota talks about Tesla. All the major automotive companies publicly talk about Tesla. Yeah. Uh, Daimler does, Volkswagen does, as a result, Porsche and Bentley do. Um, 
Uh, all, all the world's major automotive manufacturers talk about Tesla and they can because now Tesla isn't small. Tesla has justified themselves in terms of market size and capability to deliver and said these fast iterations matter. Now Musk just tweeted, Elon Musk just tweeted earlier this week again, over the long duration, the only thing that matters is how fast you iterate. The Agilists, that really, we feel that. We awesome. get that. We've been living that for, in some cases, two decades or even more. Yeah. We, we understand that. That's very core to us. And Musk almost never even uses the word agile. It comes out sometimes. But mm. it, it's what is agile is, yeah. is embodied by the companies. It's when they make more than 27 updates to a Model S in a week, that's, that's the current public figure. It's faster than that internally. But what we can say publicly yeah. is it's more than 27 updates to the Model S in a week. Now, every other company is starting to get pretty serious about Agile hardware. It's, it's very interesting, right? Because uh, on one side, Tesla, there's, there's not much out there. There's no book about Agile at Tesla or anything like that. It's almost like hidden. But we, we do know the secret sauce is what you had in mind for many, many decades. It must be very frustrating for you to uh, and let's just go back in time, like five years ago, to go to a company like one of those you just mentioned, um, and and sell the idea of Scrum and hardware, and, and they were laughing at you. And now they're now now they're basically looking back and say like, well, he knew what he was talking about, right? And there's somebody who uses that weapon against us. It's 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 a little better than that. I mean, I, I completely <laughs> hear what you're saying, and I, and I don't disagree, but it's um. Reality is what reality is, but it's how we react to it. So right. yes, life happened exactly as you said, but what it, what it did allow me to feel is really excited when clients did get on board. Mm -hmm. So there was a rocket company um, that I don't get to name, but they're in California. You might be able to guess. Yeah. And years ago, I got to work with them and they were serious about it. They wanted to make a new rocket a week, uh, which by the way, they do. And, uh, so when the clients did want to engage and they were ready, it was that much more rewarding, exciting, fulfilling. Yeah. I, it's been an amazing life so far. <laughs> yeah. Which actually segues me into something uh, other than that. I, I watched your TEDx talk, uh, which was extremely, uh, uh, it was eye opening uh, to say the least. It's very interesting to see you actually speak and have that material and, I think was a university uh, audience. Um, so that was really, uh, really interesting. You made a statement which makes, I think everyone think if you uh, hear that sentence because um, you basically said along the lines, you have only a limited amount of minutes left in your life. You didn't say hours, you said minutes, right? Or days or years, you said minutes, right? So there's this TikTok, TikTok, and I'm taking 30 of those off your life by using this this podcast, right? But it does it does put an emphasis on its minutes, its time, right? And there is how short how short is that? I want to just talk about a little bit about you personally. Uh, at the end, uh, where do you want to? How do you want to use those minutes? You said I definitely want to scrum them, you know, like those minutes left, right? So how do you want to scrum them, and what kind of stuff do you want to? I do uh, in these, and hopefully it's many, many decades uh, left, right? But um, how do you want? How do you see your uh, future as as uh, Joe Justice, but also Ricky Speed? Where do you see the potential out there for you and uh, the things you create? Social good is important to me. I I think the some impact of a life can be measured. Uh, so Ichiro Honda would say in the number of times your soul has been stirred. And from an artistic standpoint, I, I agree with that and I respect that. But I'd say that's not enough. If I think of someone else that lived and their soul was stirred many times and they lived a life of beauty, I'm not particularly grateful for that person's <laughs> life. I don't yeah. mean to be too selfish, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'd say, what did they do that improved the capability that pushed the envelope in a way that was healthy and respectful and loving? And that's exactly what I, what I want to do. And you got to overlap that with what's possible. Luckily, what's possible is, is growing really fast right now. Yeah. But if I can, I want to build space houses and say, now there's a new possibility available where people could 
live if they chose to, if they wanted to, orbiting the earth or out even further uh, mm -hmm. and have this amazing life. And when I think about uh, what's considered a luxury or high end in real estate, one of the items is a gorgeous view. Well, I can't imagine a more gorgeous view than permanently being geo or being uh, in orbit above sunrise forever, mm. looking at the rim of the earth spinning over or even some other planet or asteroid. So I can imagine a first audience being ultra luxury. And if space travel continues at the trajectory it's on right now, it may be possible. Well, let, let, let's back into this. If you talk to someone in the 1950s, yeah. And so 70, 70 years ago mm -hmm. and said, um, information is going to be free anywhere on the planet and it'll be near instantaneous. <laughs> I'm saying you're, you're nuts. <laughs> if you talk to someone in the nineties, so 30 years ago and right. said storage is going to be free and instantaneously available on your watch or anything else anywhere on the planet, they, most of them would have said you're nuts. Yes. Well, I'm going to say on the current trajectory, it is not unlikely that in our lifetime, travel to and from near orbit, so maybe the moon, is going to be free and available every day. <laughs> I believe it's the current trajectory. And, and people will look and say, that's nuts. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I, I think we're on to something. Cool, right? so, yeah. so if that were to come to pass, and I think it's uh, actually, I, I believe that's the likely future, um, that travel even of significant weight, you know, hundreds of kilograms, even thousands of kilograms will be essentially free and daily. Well, then it makes perfect sense that you could hitch the next ride back and forth multiple times a day to your space mm -hmm. house. If that's true, I would like to have that technology ready and have it already be at an ultra affordable price point so that I can engage at many different levels and make it something that most humans on the world could engage in if they wanted to. At the same time, I'd like to take the concepts of safety, security, and comfort and make them completely available without question as a human right to all almost 8 billion people on the planet. So yeah. safety, security, and comfort is just a non-concern. The yeah. base level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is completely satisfied. That's, that's actually even bigger and harder than space houses. Yeah. Interestingly, I see those as two steps on the same timeline using the same scrum for hardware technology. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is, uh, this is very futuristic and, and probably you're right. Um, you know, I laugh myself, you know, about space housing, but you know, if we are having uh, an increasing population on this planet, we might need to explore that option. Uh, we might need to uh, see some other form of uh, how we can populate and, uh, you, know, you know, maybe we go on vacation, uh, maybe we live, I don't know, maybe, maybe there is something uh, out there. You're also spending uh, your time with a very low carbon footprint, uh, if I understand that correctly. So there is this, a lot of connection to, um, you know, being environmentally cautious and et cetera. Tell me a little bit about it. Like, um, and the listeners more importantly, like, what do you do not only to reduce the carbon footprint, but how do you involved in, in green initiatives? Oh, I, I, I love it. You're, you're hitting all my passions. Thank you so much. I'm grateful for it. <laughs> Uh, and, and you share many of these same passions as we were talking about before the record button was pressed. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've, uh, I've started living part time in my race car. It's a Tesla race car. Mm -hmm. And behind the front seats, there's enough room for a single extra long bed. I got a $69 mattress from Linen Spa on Amazon. It's actually phenomenally comfortable. Wow. And what that's let me do uh, before lockdown is drive to the different famous racetracks in the U S and race and sleep in the back and do video chats in the front seat and do my professional consulting in the front seat. Now, why would you even want to do that is a very obvious and natural question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But for me, it's, it's part of the progression of, of trying to figure out, a superior housing solution. I'm not saying people need to live in their mm. ultra efficient electric race cars. What I am saying is, I, I think the building materials that are gonna scale, especially interstellar, 
are mm -hmm. less likely to be wood and they're less likely to be concrete. That's not impossible, actually. There's some foams that, that might make sense there. Mm -hmm. But I think they're a lot more likely to be the types of materials rockets are made out of, at least in the near term. So that mm -hmm. means metals and composites. And guess what else is made out of metals and composites that's available in, well, that Wikispeed has deep experience with race cars. Mm -hmm. So if I'm thinking these houses are likely in the near term to be metals and composites, spending time working with metals and composites and, and living in them in something like a house, prototyping that idea right. is not a bad idea. Plus the carbon footprint is almost zero. And it gives me uh, experience with a very different type of living than I've ever experienced before. I've always been in a uh, detached single family home or a few times an apartment or a condo. And mm -hmm. for a little while I even lived in a penthouse, which was, mm -hmm. it was awesome. Yeah. Well, so this is a, a different exploration as I figure out what's really needed and learn uh, a different angle to solve the same problems. What's showering like? What's the gym like? What's mm -hmm. shaving mm -hmm. and looking really well groomed? During all this, I try to look like a top tier global consultant. Shaved really well, I try to be really fit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to be, I want to look like someone that could be invited to a White House dinner at any time mm -hmm. and have that make sense. Mm -hmm. And I want to have a crazy amount of fun. Something I, I think uh, the current wave of environmentalism is doing super well is giving more and making it more environmentally friendly. So for example, the car I'm in is one of the fastest cars in its class and some versions of it are the fastest car in the world. Well, that's not a trade-off anymore. And it's not a small car either. It's actually roomier than the other cars in its class. And some of the other cars of, from this company are some of the roomiest cars in the world in, 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 of their type. Mm -hmm. So it's not these trade-offs anymore. So my thought is how to make wonderful housing that has basically zero footprint and uh, other accessory factors. Like, like it, it can do, it, it can aid people who want to do compost to garden on site. It could aid people who want to do recycling mm -hmm. to manufacturing on site, which I understand that's a very small subset of the planet, but it could do that for people who want to. Well, how to do that in a house that's bigger and cheaper and more luxurious than what we have now. And I think that's the only fun path forward, how to make huge, cheap, safe, luxurious houses or living spaces, whatever it is, maybe they're rockets, mm -hmm. <laughs> with almost zero carbon footprint. And uh, I'm prototyping that with my own lifestyle. So mm -hmm. part of what I wish to do with my life before I die, if I can, is to try to live the most fashionable, fun, rewarding, red carpet looking, red carpet being, healthy, yeah. happy life I can, so that other people might want to try it yeah in a way that has a net environmental positive back to the planet back to the universe and not just for humans i mean if if prairie dogs want to live in my yard too if i have a yard i i would want to help that right yeah. so how to have a lot of healthy species coexist i'd like to try to figure that out and i prototype that every week with the backlog that is my life. I live my life with a backlog. I do retrospectives. I have daily review yeah. meetings with whoever's collaborating with me and, and try to make that as awesome as possible. I, I don't know if you are, but you should be blogging about this or have some form of an experience sharing that with, a, with the world out there and then see like, hey, what is Joe Justice doing today? He's coming out of his tiny house, you know, because that's what it sounds like. You're a right now is smaller than the tiny house movement right now being in that car, right? So uh, you are, you are the, the prototype developer um, uh, in, in that regard. Awesome, oh, Joe. This the, is, the, plan for the, the plan for the next house is more than 10,000 square feet. So it, it's, 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 the intention is to be massive, but cheap and low, low footprint and ultra luxury. But yes, right now it's the other end. It's, it's even smaller than a tiny house. Really yes. Smaller. <laughs> But that awesome. blog, I think, is Agile FM. Um, may maybe, maybe I can uh, give short updates every now and again when something truly interesting happens. And if they're oh, truly interesting, maybe it's good enough for Agile FM. 
Of course, absolutely. I think we should be uh, we should be looking into something and uh, take some pictures and maybe we can put something on the show page and maybe we have some repeat or anything where you feel like, okay, I had a, it doesn't have to be a breakthrough moment, but if you have a, a moment where like that is something that really relates very well, we should have a short session on this. Why not? <laughs> I, I think that would be phenomenal. Let's, yeah. let, let's aim that way. Let's aim that way. And if enough yeah. good, interesting things happen, well, sure, let's share. Let's do it. I think that sounds great. And uh, for I know you are in a very, very safe car. It gets a lot of safe, safety uh, awards and uh, it scores very, very high. But please wear a helmet if you are uh, on the racetrack and uh, stay safe. And we'll talk soon. Thank you, Joe. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Joe Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon.